Hey everyone, welcome to another amazing episode of the Caregiver Coffee Chat podcast. I am so excited about my next guest that I have on today. Her name is Lauren Rose and she's a busy mamapreneur as well as a mom that does battle chronic illness. And I think this is a topic that is not talked about enough. Um, For those of you who have been in my space for a while, you know that I deal with IBS and hypothyroidism. And so, you know, I I have my good days and bad days too. But when I was listening to Lauren's story, she really has some rough days, right? And so I think I just really want to encourage you mamas out there that if you're a mom, if you're a caregiver for a spouse, and if you're also you yourself dealing with health issues, health issues, whether it's a chronic illness, um, an injury or mental health, that you are not alone. Okay. And that some days it legitly, like the name of our episode, it legitly hurts to mom. (laughs) And I just Mm -hmm. want you to know that there are moms in the internet world that want to stand by you and support you through the ups and downs of this journey. So Lauren, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. (laughs) Thanks. I'm so excited to be here and to talk to you and to your listeners. I think it's, it's definitely not talked about enough um, this whole chronic pain, chronic illness journey has been incredibly lonely for me, especially when it comes to parenting with chronic illness. So I'm glad to be on. Yeah. And especially if you're in the parenting stage of younger children that are not self-sufficient and as independent yet, it's draining because let's face it, honestly, I have a four-year-old and keeping up with her when I'm having a flare-up day is like, oh boy, here we go. So I can only imagine when you're actually in pain, I get more like gut issues as my main thing that I have to deal with. So it's, you know, dealing with, um, you know, dealing with gut and all the lovely thing that goes with that. So I can't imagine being in chronic pain or just hurting and then just not being feeling like you have to or knowing that you need to move, but you can't even physically do that because you're in so much pain. Um, My mom, uh, she dealt with fibromyalgia and a lot of chronic pain related that. So I get, so I have a little backstory on that, but personally still, I mean, with a small kiddo, I mean, that has to be so overwhelming. So let's um, fill in our listeners a little bit more with your story, Lauren. So um, why don't you share a little bit more about, we'll get into the business side in a little bit, because that's going to um, trickle in after, but what is your journey with your illness and when did this journey start for you? Oh, yes. So um, I'm 43 right now. Um, I have a 10 year old daughter right now. My chronic illness started when I was about eight in the form of depression, and anxiety. My chronic pain started when I was about 15 in the form of migraines and tension headaches. And I didn't really get any help for any of those things because I didn't realize that those things weren't normal. Like I didn't know that it wasn't normal to be having these horrible headaches every day and that it wasn't normal to be feeling kind of blah and sad and not interested in anything. So I finally started getting help um, for my headaches at 21. That's when I was diagnosed with the migraines and the tension headaches. Ended up, I've got also some other kind of headaches, some TMJ disorder headaches, some occipital neuralgia headaches. Mm. Um, and then I got help for my depression when I was 22. And then when I was 35, um, I started, I, I went to a, a into a, an inpatient four week pain recovery program for my headaches because they'd gotten just so out of control. I'd had the same migraine for like 19 straight days. I was, you know, I had seen dozens of practitioners. I mean, regular Western medicine, Eastern medicine. I mean, if, if it was out there, I probably had tried it, I tried herbs and acupuncture and all sorts of different modalities. And so I entered this pain recovery program And I actually learned that um, 50 to 80% of our physical pain is from emotional pain. So that was really interesting and interesting information because I'd I'd had um, a lot of trauma in my life and I wasn't the kind of person who just wore my feelings on my sleeve. I always just stuffed them down. And then after getting out of that program, um, just within a couple of months, I learned that I have autoimmune disease. So I've got spondyloarthropathy, which is a family of rheumatic diseases that cause arthritis. I've got degenerative and inflammatory arthritis, spinal degeneration. And all of this was at at age 35. Um, When I was, yeah, (laughs) when I was 37, I just turned 37 a few days before I had to go on short-term disability because I'd gotten some injections, some steroid injections that 
um, made my my back pain even worse. And then while I was on short term disability, I developed the fibromyalgia. So it, it also my arthritis spread. Originally, it was just in my low back. That's why I went on short term disability was low back. But then when I was on short term disability, my arthritis spread to my shoulders and my knees and my hips and the rest of my back and my hands and my feet. So basically anywhere you've got a joint, my joint started to hurt. Um, so I actually became disabled at 37. Um, I got the letter from the government saying I was disabled when I was 39, but I'd been disabled for two years by then. So yeah, I'm currently on um, social security disability because I can't work because of my pain. And um, it, it was it was hard. I went into a deep depression for the next two years. I felt like I'd lost my life's purpose in life. Yeah, part of my purpose in life was to take care of my family, but I wasn't even doing a very good job of that, <laughs> right? Right, yeah. So, <clears throat> I can, all, wow, what a story. I mean, well, I, I, I just really resonate with you because my mom, her chronic journey started at age 20 and that lasted until mm -hmm. she passed away at 70. So she had 50 years of chronic illness and it was a slow progression. It's like, it's kind of like what your story was one thing after another. Um, personally for me, I got diagnosed with 22 when my immune system just crashed, my thyroid just mm -hmm. totally crashed when, and I was sick and got really sick. And that was when I was 22 and I had a really bad bout of depression. And then um, then last year, or no, oh, no, well, uh, 2021, December of 2021 is when I finally got diagnosed after being chronically sick and undiagnosed with IB, um, that it was IBS for a year, um, yeah. it, for me. But, and that's the thing I want to say, say too is that unfortunately, with chronic illnesses, guys, once one happens, it's unfortunately kind of the gateway to a lot more. Um, everyone's different. Um, obviously, my mother and like Lauren are the exception. They've kind of been hit with the gauntlet of chronic illnesses, unfortunately, which I feel so bad about. Um, so kind of taking it back, though, how did that impact your motherhood journey? I mean, as this was happening, when was motherhood coming in and how did that impact with your health? How did that impact your motherhood journey? Yeah, so I had my baby um, when I was 32, the, about six days before I turned 33. And at that time, all I was dealing with, quote unquote, were the the severe daily migraines and, and he other kinds of headaches. And so I had my baby and um, the worst part was just the the sounds of baby cry babies, the baby crying, um, especially when I was having a migraine and the best way I dealt with that, it took me a while to figure that out, was earplugs. <laughs> so whenever she was crying and I had a migraine or she was throwing a fit and I was just full of anxiety, I would just put some earplugs in and it would tone it down a little bit. But then when she was three, that's when my my low back pain started. We we had taken her to the zoo and I don't know what I did at the zoo that day, but something happened by the time we went home. I don't know if I twisted myself wrong or I don't know, maybe running after her cause she was three. So she was always running off. Um, by the end of that zoo trip, my L5 S1 discs were in so much pain. I thought I had fractured my spine. Oh, and I mean, it was, it was really bad. I mean, that's how, much, how bad my pain was for, for all of that time was I, I actually thought I'd fractured it. And yeah, I, I mean, I went to go get x-rayed and, and they didn't see a fracture. Um, so I didn't know what the heck was causing this, this awful pain. And I mean, it was, it was hard to pick up my baby, you know, when she was little, I mean, I've got good support from my husband, but when you know, he was at work and I was on maternity leave or he hadn't made it home from work yet. I was dealing with the migraines and the low back pain. And she's an active kid. She was running around a lot. Um, luckily, she's a good kid, so she didn't get in a lot of trouble. But she also needs a lot of attention. Even to this day, she's 10 and she still needs a lot of mommy's attention. So it's been really hard. I've had to modify a lot of the tasks that I do and the ways mm -hmm. that I they, that I interact with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's important to say is that there's no right or wrong way to mom. Okay. We're, we all have different journeys. We all have a different personality. And if you're, especially are dealing with a chronic illness, 
it might mean that it's a little bit more complicated and you kind of have to get really creative and think outside the box to be able to balance that role as a mom, but also be prioritizing yourself for one to make sure that you're taking care of yourself because you can't fill an empty cup. I know it's so quick today and (laughs) self-care is a buzzword on the internet still to this day, but I think, but it is so true. Cause I mean, you know, it really is the foundation. I mean, if we don't take care of ourselves, especially if we have a chronic illness, then it's going to mean that we're going to pay for it in a very nasty way. And then we aren't going to be able to invest in our children and show up and um, with our kids the way that we want. I know for me, if I um, don't stay hydrated, if I don't stick to my diet, then I will pay for it with a lot of stomach attacks and just feeling lousy and I won't be able to function. So it's not fun. Um, And sometimes it's not, it hurts to mom because you have to do so many elaborate things. Like for me with my diet, I have to be, I'm on a very limited diet. I am soy-free, gluten-free, dairy-free, grain-free, (laughs) meat-free. Yeah, it's very limited, you know, about what I can have. But at the same time, I want you guys to see um, those uh, non-negotiable rules, if you will, as a form of self-care. Okay. Mm -hmm. Managing a chronic illness can be different from day to day, but if you have your rule book, as it were, and you take prior, you prioritize, what do I need to do? So for me, it's, I'm on a limited diet. I get, I have to buy special foods. So it means also, since I have family members that eat a regular diet, it means batching my food. So I don't have to be batching and batching their food. So sometimes we have leftovers for a few days. So that kind of tones down on the amount of time I'm in the kitchen. Um, it might mean just being intentional with making sure I keep my water bottle like I am right now on this call. I have my water with me so I can stay hydrated and get my 90 ounces of water in for the day. It might mean for Lauren, it it might mean, um, what would that be for you, Lauren? Like, what is a modification you've had to make in your journey? So a big one is playing with my daughter because she loves to play with me. So we know when her friends come over, they'll get on the floor and they'll play with her American Girl dolls or their Barbie dolls. But I usually can't get on the floor because it causes too much low back and hip pain. So if she wants to play, I might have to get up on the bed. And sometimes I sit up on the bed and play with her. Sometimes I'm so bad, I'm literally lying on the bed doing the voices of the characters and she's moving the dolls around for me. Or if she wants to play a board game, but I'm in too much pain to sit up, I will lie on the couch and she will, you know, move all the little pieces and, you know, spin the spinner or roll the die. So if in, in a movie night, I usually spend movie night lying on the couch. So I, they're having the long couch to myself so I can lie down and sit up and move around because staying in one position, you know, hurts a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's no shame in that. So do whatever you need to do. And I think another one too, is just having a, uh, a conversation with your spouse too, about that. Like, how can they support you with those modifications? I know for me, um, when, uh, we were doing my elimination diet for all of 2021, just trying to figure out what the heck was going on. I was going to multiple, I went through four different doctors. I was keeping a notebook that was just plumb full of all these different notes and things I noticed when I would try eating a certain food and just realizing really quickly that a lot of the foods I used to eat as a vegan and plant-based eater, I can't eat anymore. And I'm still Mm plant-based, but now I have to modify and cut out grain and soy. So it's like, okay, this is getting really interesting. So, but having that support from my husband of understanding that, listen, I can't eat that stuff anymore. I have to even get more elaborate. And like, to this day, I'm so thankful that when we're out shopping, you'll see something that says it's plant-based and, or soy-free or grain-free, but he'll double check because sometimes, unfortunately, they still have the ingredients that we're not supposed to eat. But just having that support of like, here, oh, I see something you might be able to try. Let, let's see, you know, to kind of give me a little bit of a break and some variety. And to, but him, to see him also being careful and not just taking the label at its word, looking behind on mm-hmm. the, or the or the front logo of the packaging, if, uh, excuse me, as it were, and actually looking at the ingredients and making sure um, that I don't have a trigger food, you know, ingredient right. in there. So it it is important to have that um, conversation of what besides the logistic of, you know, on this at this time of day, can you take over taking care of? I have a daughter too, so can you take care of our daughter? um, during this time so I can rest or, and, and trying to make it fair. Cause I have to, cause it goes both ways. I know with me, with my husband, with his epilepsy, he has to have extra sleep. And so when he has that two hour window of a nap every day, uh, especially on days that he needs to work, 
Um, I take over watching Linda, you know, I take over watching my daughter so um, he can have that time to rest. So it is a tag team effort, but I know too, um, unfortunately with chronic illness, there's that impact of that on your marriage because it, it sometimes means that one spouse is having to pick up the slack for the other. And that can be frustrating and it can be embarrassing. I know some, there's sometimes shame involved, but there should be no shame guys, because it is not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. So, um, Lauren, could you share a little bit? I mean, share discretionary at what you feel comfortable with, of course, but how has this illness, your health impacted your marriage and what have been some healthy, maybe tools that have helped you and your husband figure out a balance in a system that just works for your unique, um, situation. Yeah, so it definitely has a huge impact. Um, a lot of it is just self-imposed, though. I do feel a lot of shame if I have to spend the whole day in bed and I don't get anything at all done, not even opening the mail. And so my husband will come home or I'll text him ahead of time and just say, by the way, I couldn't get anything done today. I'm really sorry. And I'm blessed with just an incredibly understanding husband. Um, who never makes me feel bad for that. He'll always say, it's fine, I don't mind. So we definitely work together when it comes to like doing the chores and cleaning the house. I try to do a little bit, you know, every day, but some days that just doesn't happen at all. So, mm -hmm. you know, week weekend rolls around, we'll, you know, get our daughter involved and the three of us will will take care of it. And, you know, we just explained to her, you know, mommy can't do it all. And, you know, daddy works a full-time job. So we've got to work together that, you know, we're a team. This is a team effort to keep this house going. Um, I don't get to spend a, as much time with my husband as I'd like. Usually on date nights, we can't actually go on a date because I'm not, I'm in too much pain. I'm not up for it. So we spend most of our date nights, which are, you know, usually once a month, um, just hanging in at home, watching a movie on TV or, you know, catching up on a show. Um, I just, I, I, I just, I feel just so much inadequacy. I feel like I'm not adequate as a wife and a mother, you know, and a stay at home, you know, spouse and, and mother, but I'm really lucky that my husband never makes me feel that way. Oh, what a blessing. Bravo. Bravo. Shout out to your husband <laughs> for being wonderful. Um, that is tough. That is tough. Um, because just the logistics of, like you said, running your home, trying to keep up on tasks. Um, I know for me, it has shifted quite a lot. I do the bills. Um, I'm the driver. I'm the primary driver now since my husband cannot. Um, but instead of being one of, instead of being, you know, a, a big portion of our income, my husband's the one that, you know, we're, like we're dealing, we collect social security disability as well, you know, for my husband and he only can work part-time, which is good for his mental health. I'm thankful that he's yeah. in that, in the bracket of um, chronically ill people that can still work because it's good for him to get out of the house and feel like he's a contributing member of society to, um, by working and also just providing, you know, as a man, just providing for your husband, but I know for me, that's still something I struggle with, with building my business and, um, and, and it's still being in its infant stages to some degree that um, I'm not making the income that I made when I practice as an aide. And so that has been mm -hmm. tough for me, but I'm picking up, but I have to give myself grace. And my husband's great about reminding me that, Hey, you're building a business from scratch with no prior experience. You're a stay at home mom. Now you're caring for me and our daughter and you're helping take care of, you know, your father, um, cause we live with my dad. So there's a lot of different things that I am doing that I, you know, I do a lot of the laundry. I do, I cook most of the meals cause my dad, um, he just doesn't have the capacity to do that as much. He gets tired. So I don't mind, you know, but, and I'm running a business. So it, it, it is kind of hard when you have to do those role shifts, you know, and you, and there is that natural inclination for shame, but you know what? There is no shame because we're dealt, our families have been dealt some really extenuating circumstances. And I think I want to normalize for those listening and other out there that, and, and other people that um, may not be listening that need to hear this, that, that there is no shame. It's not your fault. Chronic illness is not something that you intentionally do to yourself. It just happens. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a family history in your family tree or earlier in life to necessarily get it. It just happens and it hits you. And the best thing that I want people to take away from this um, conversation is that 
you're doing the best you can. You know your family better than you do. And yes, you might have to make some modifications to make it work for your situation, but that doesn't mean that you can't still have a healthy, strong marriage. That doesn't mean that you can't be um, raising beautiful human beings in this world. That doesn't mean that you still can't go after your dreams. I mean, look at look at <laughs> look at Lauren and I. We're both running businesses and we have health issues and we're caring or and we're caring for small kiddos. So it it's it can be challenging. I'm not gonna say that it's all highs, but and that there's not lows, but it is possible. It is possible. A chronic illness is not a death sentence. Right. And it's definitely been a mindset shift for me because yes, there are days when my pain controls what I can and cannot do. But, you know, after I got out of that depression, I decided to use my chronic pain to help other people. And that's why I started, you know, my, it hurts to mom brand. Um, Cause I, I, I don't believe that this is for nothing. And I refuse to just give in to my chronic pain, chronic illness, and just let it control my life and determine my destiny. That just is not how I want to go out. No, I agree. I agree. I wouldn't want that either. I, I know for me, so kind of a similar story. Um, I'm, I, every day I'm thankful I had that 15 year um, background in healthcare because that has saved my hide with um, being able to just get a system and a rhythm for managing my husband's illness. Granted, in the beginning, I felt like I was back in medical school because I was really having mm. to educate myself a lot on his illness because I never had um, prior experience with an epileptic patient or seizure patient in my career. So it was definitely new and I had to hardcore educate myself. So that was like, whoa, but it also really has opened my eyes to just how much knowledge I do have and things I have been, I've had, I've been blessed to just know and be able to implement back into my life because of my training and just realizing the average mom out there and wife out there doesn't have that. And so to hear those, no one wants to hear a scary diagnosis, whether it's chronic or life-threatening X, Y, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how do you navigate that? You know, where do you start? If it, that was me, I'd be, I know I'd be scared of like, what questions do I ask? Where do I start searching for resources? Um, where do I find logistical support? I mean, I know for me and my journey, finding a support system that was targeted more at moms who had had to were kind of forced out of an, a life altering illness situation to be a, become a stay at home mom. And also just being a caregiver that's in that bracket at a younger age, you know, not that the expected age that we think of when our children are grown and our spouses and you are like over the age of 65, that just has become my anthem of like, okay, I'm going to stand up for these moms and help them figure out how to manage being a caregiver with no prior medical experience and feeling no shame for having to shift careers, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, and of just of switching from workforce to being home full-time and caregiving and carrying the load of motherhood. Yeah. The big thing that I do is research. So I might not have a lot of questions when I first get the diagnosis, but by golly, I go home and I just research and, you know, go to the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic websites. There's a lot of, you know, great government sources i on like fibromyalgia i bought books because there's not a lot of great information on online about fibromyalgia and that way i i've even googled like questions to ask my doctor about rheumatoid arthritis or questions mm -hmm. to ask my doctor about whatever it is and then that'll yeah. give me a great list of questions to go mm -hmm. back and and follow up with my doctor about so research because right. i feel like the more i know about something the less scary it is Absolutely. Edu knowledge is power. But also, too, I will say, too, besides getting in the knowledge, you need to write it down and just getting, mm -hmm. and just paying attention once you understand X, Y, and Z or, okay, these are normal. I have normal taboo symptoms. Okay, so um, I need to write that down. And, th and then just you can elaborate that on as you go. And so that's why I'm a big um, preacher for um, having a medical log, because you can't mm -hmm. remember everything all the time. So when something happens, whether it's a new symptom, a flare up um, and change in care with a with doctors or the doc, your doctor that you've been with for eons changes your medication or treatment plan. Writing it all down is gives your brain a bit of a break because you have it written down. You can refer, refer back to it. And it's helpful, too, with giving your medical team, uh, every time you write something down um, for them, it gives them a better picture of what's going on. Because I, whether you're the um, person who is ill or you're the person who's caring for the person who's ill, 
having as much information as possible about what's been going on gives the medical professional, professional speaking from experience, um, a place of where to start um, with figuring out what the best options are for care in that person with that person's unique situation. Because um, you're when you're at home, the doctors aren't there. They're not observing you unless you come in and do like, say, a stint in the hospital where they have you under monitoring. Otherwise, you know, they're really going on by word of mouth. So to help yourself out and to help your medical team out, guys, um, whether it's, for, again, for you or the person you're caregiving for, just have a medical log, write it down and write down anything that's new, um, write down your baseline of what's normal. So that way, you know, like, oh, this is changing or this is shifting. And that will clue in your doctors and your medical team. It'll be a big red flag to them. And they'll know, okay, we're going to definitely dive deeper into this. Um, yes. And like, and like um, Lauren said, research is good. I know for me, uh, the biggest problem I ran into is that um, epilepsy, there's still so much that is unfortunate with that diagnosis, that there's still so much that is un, you know, not, not known because you're dealing with the brain. And unfortunately, this illness, unfortunately, is an individualistic illness because no two brains are the same. Even if you have a family member that has epilepsy or a seizure disorder as well, I guarantee you their citration and dosing of medication will be completely different. Their, res their reaction to a said either surgery, device placement, medication regimes will be 100% different too. There might be some similarities, but again, you're dealing with someone unique, you know, um, unique brain. So right now it really is like throwing spaghetti at the wall to find out what that sweet spot is for each patient. And so um, educate yourself as much. If you're in a, in your, if you're in a niche or I'm sorry, not niche, but if you're in a um, situation where you're dealing with a uh, with um, a chronic illness that doesn't have as much um, research or information about it, really pay attention to what you're saying and what you're doing because it could help somebody else out. Knowledge is power, and even though your situation is tough, it could still help somebody else out because the more we share, the more we can help, and hopefully find a much better streamlined approach to. Um, a better treatment and, you know, Lord willing, a cure. But for now, you know, what we can, we can do what we can do in our own certain ways. Um, even, even if it's not being a mompreneur, like what Lauren and I are with running businesses. Um, so Lauren, uh, what would you want to say to the moms out there who are dealing with chronic illness, whether they're in the, let's take it back to the begin stages. So let's say a mom has just found out that she has a chronic illness. What are your three best tips to help her figure out a way to cope through um, that's non-negotiable? Three non-negotiable first steps after receiving that that is said diagnosis. So number one, and you mentioned this earlier, talk to your family about your, your pain or illness. So do your research. Um, there, If it's pain, there's a great book called A Day Without Pain by Dr. Mel Pohl and explains how pain signals are created. So the physiology of pain. Um, there's a great book called Why Does Mommy Hurt by Elizabeth M. Christie. I read that to my daughter when she was, you know, three, four or five years old. And it's about fibromyalgia, but I, I inserted my own diagnoses in there. So I would say, you know, instead of just fibromyalgia, arthritis and fibromyalgia. I made it something that what we talked about a lot. Um, my family knows about my pain. My daughter knows, okay, I'm hurting. I can only play with you for 20 minutes. And then when I'm in too much pain, I can't play anymore. I'll just let her know, hey, you know, mommy's hip is really starting to hurt. I've got to get up. Or if it's anxiety or depression related, you know, mommy's got a lot of anxiety right now. I'm really overwhelmed. You know, can you support me? So making it just a conversation, just a normal conversation in the house you know, answering questions, honestly, if it's the young kids, you know, it doesn't have to be in too much detail, but, you know, keep it age appropriate. Um, two, you know, the buzzword self-care. And the way I think about self-care is if you're waiting until you just can't take it anymore to do self-care, it's like being underwater and coming up for air. And if you wait until your lungs just can't take it, you're coming up for air and you're gasping, right? You're going to go back Absolutely. underwater you're gonna go back underwater. You're not gonna feel calm and relaxed. You're gonna feel like, when can I get that next breath of air? But if you're coming up for air on a regular basis, when you're coming up for air, you're gonna be calm. You're gonna go back down, you're gonna be relaxed. So self-care isn't selfish, it's essential. And 
I don't necessarily just mean, you know, things like, you know, journaling or going for a walk. I, I do mean things that make you happy like that. For me, you know, it's playing Wordle in the mornings before my daughter gets up. That's one thing that I do. Um, another element of self-care, stopping the negative self-talk. We can acknowledge that we feel like bad moms, but also acknowledge that we're actually not. We're doing the best we can, give ourselves grace. Self-care might mean a little bit of therapy, um, even just once a month or just for a few sessions. They've got online therapy now, it's great. And by the way, your therapist's job is to put them out of a job. So if you've been seeing the same therapist about the same issues for years, it's not working. You need to try somebody else. And self-care can also look about look like medications or supplements. So um, depression, anxiety, there's no shame in taking something short-term or even long-term. I do. I've been on antidepressants for 21 years now. And I do it because because my, my daughter hates taking medications. I hate taking medications, but I explained to her, it's helping me be the be best version of myself for myself and my family. Um, there's also lots of, you know, just natural supplements. There's CBD, there's vitamins. You might be low in, in vitamin D3 or B12 or magnesium. So get those things checked. And my last tip is just be present. So like we talked about, I have to modify a lot of things to meet my needs, but you know what? My daughter doesn't care. I had her on my very first podcast episode and I did a little interview with her and she doesn't mind that I have to modify these tasks. All she cares about is I am spending that time with her. She just wants the attention. She just wants the quality time. She doesn't care if I have to lie down and she has to do all the work. She, she doesn't mind. She knows that I'm doing my best and that I love her. And, and that's what really matters. Absolutely. Amen. Will said, and, um, I really like that you said, um, uh, you know, that point about don't wait until it's at a breaking point. That's the mm -hmm. biggest mistake I made with my IBS, um, mm -hmm. tail end of Q4 of 2020, um, is when I started feeling I was having my, I get, got, I had gotten gut attacks from my hypothyroidism. And so I went plant-based to deal with it, but in 20, end of 2020, it was worse than normal. So that's when I knew something was wrong. But of course I skipped my wellness visit. We're in the middle of the pandemic. I was so focused on just my husband and my daughter with everything we had going on. Cause we still, we'd just barely gotten a diagnosis and his seizure act. was just still out of control. And, um, I pushed it off until I got, I got to that point, like you said, where I just couldn't take anymore. And I was gasping for air by the time April or May of 2021 hit. And then it was just a marathon after that, of just trying a gauntlet of trying to figure out what was wrong. I went through four doctors cause I hadn't been keeping my MP in the loop. And so then she said, so when she exhausted everything that she thought it could be, it went to a general surgeon. Then after that, it went to um, in the midst of that, we found out, like you said, I found out, oh no, you're, <laughs> you're vitamin D deficient. So we're going to start you on that. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. And then we found out. Um, and then when I started on that, then um, they did more labs, routine labs, um, just to also monitor my thyroid, make sure it wasn't wacky and that wasn't the culprit, but it wasn't. And then they found out, oh, your iron's low. So we're going to start you on iron medication for that as well. Hello. Um, and then we finally got to the point where like, okay, it's either IBD or IBS. Okay. If IBD um, you know, I can, you can test for, uh, and if, you know, if your sample that we do with a colonoscopy comes back clean, we know it's that, or if it's, if it's, if it's normal, then we know it's IBS because IBS is chronic and there's no test for it. But, and it's like through this whole process, I'm like, I'm playing catch up. Mm -hmm. Looking back at that, I was freaking playing catch up the whole experience. And so guys, if you take nothing from this interview, Please don't get to the point where you're gasping for air, where you're at your breaking point, where then you have to spend X amount of months of weeks, days playing catch up because then, because that impacts your family. So then I had to spend a lot of time in doctor's offices. I had to arrange, you know, childcare and someone to be with my husband. So he would make sure he's safe and, you know, just more time and money. So, mm -hmm. You know, don't wait till your breaking point, figure out what your non-negotiables are. And it can look different. You know, Lauren talked about how she likes to play Wordle before she gets up. For me, it's I get up, I get dressed, um, I fill my tumbler with water to start my 90 ounces of water. I get my one hot cup of caffeinated tea for the morning. And I come into my office and I do my devotional program before I, my intensive devotional program before I even start my work tasks. And I also do, you know, journaling in the evening. I mean, there's all these blocks of non-negotiable time and it's throughout your day. Self-care is not about, oh, it's one and done. It's 
How are you stopping and pausing and investing in your mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical self-care throughout the day? Yes, like Lauren said, and I agree too, you know, like, um, you know, going for a walk and getting enough sleep and getting enough hydration are important because, you know, we, we do have, our bodies are like a machine. We do have to fuel them with the right thing, but it's also important guys that we do take care of our mind and our soul. They're just as important. <laughs> Yeah. So, and your creativity too, your creative, your creativity too. So what are your hobbies? What do you like? Even if it's just um, one thing I'm working on trying to get implemented is setting a timer for 15 minutes. This was my Christian life coach. who suggested this and I love her for it. Set a timer for whatever task you want to do, whether it's work related, hobby related, self-care related, whatever you want to interject in there. And just be clear with your, with your family or your kiddos and say, Hey, okay. When the timer goes off, you can have mommy back. But for this 15 or 20 or 30 minutes or whatever, this is mommy time, okay? Or whatever you want to call it. And just establish that boundary. And that is so beautiful, guys, because that shows your kids, you know, the importance of investing in themselves. Like, oh, it's okay if it's okay if I take time out of the day for just me and doing something that lights me up. It's a it jolly well is okay. So how can, so with this topic of sometime it, sometimes it's, it hurts to mom, how can we leverage this journey by modeling an, uh, uh, modeling an example of where we're teaching our daughters, we're teaching our sons that it's okay to take care of yourself and it's vital that you take care of yourself and you can do it in a way that works for you. Whether you have, whether they have their own health issues, whether it's mental health or a physical chronic illness, like rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, or IBS or hypothyroidism, like, you know, Lauren and I do. So it's, there's no, there's no, unfortunately, there's no one-on-one rule book that is a playbook that you can just follow. It's very individualistic and you have to figure out what works for you. And if you're needing more support, Lauren and I want to come alongside you and give that to you in whatever capacity it is, whether it's mother, whether it's balancing motherhood and caregiving for a sick spouse uh, with no prior medical history or like it's Lauren where you're where where you are the parent that's sick and you just don't know how to do it and you're needing some support and just feeling like you're not the only you know the only pebble on the beach so Lauren with that being said is um where can we find more Lauren um where can people connect with you if they are interested in working with you and just starting that process Sure. I'm on Instagram at it hurts to mom. If you look under my pain relief story highlight, you'll find 30 ways to relieve pain without taking a pill. You can also find that resource at it hurts to mom.com slash tips. You can email me at it hurts to mom at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash it hurts to mom. You can also listen to my podcast. It's called it hurts to mom on Apple music and Spotify. Just search for it. Nice. Awesome. And do you have any particular like paid resources or programs coming out um, in this quarter or throughout the year? No, not at the moment. Okay. Well, follow her guys. So if she does update, you guys will be the first to know. Um, And if you're struggling with your motherhood and caregiving journey um, this week, I actually have a new monthly workshop for this month is STEM prioritizing self-care in 2023. And this is where I teach you with my STEM method guys, how to stay spiritually connected, manage your thoughts, release your emotions with the support of a support network, and uh, just moving throughout the day. So basically physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual self-care. But I will teach you how to create a self-care routine that is realistic to you, where you are also doing it with the intention of um, not only just creating the routine, but you're doing it where you're supported, whether that is with family or friends or home health or hospice and a lot of other things that we will talk about. So I will leave a description in the description box below. If you're watching this on Spotify, Anchor, or my YouTube channel, and also on my website and just hurry guys, because I'm only giving access to this workshop through Friday this week. After that, it goes up to $97 and goes into my paid content bank. Um, and as always, if you have any further questions about upcoming guests or topics, uh, spe- uh, specific um, topics in the realm of motherhood, caregiving, and self-care that you would like me to address, feel free. I will also leave the form um, to submit your questions and um, topic ideas below as well so you can submit those. And follow me on Instagram as well at Melissa Miller 2011 So um, Lauren, before we wind down this interview, is there anything um, either in our conversation that we've had today or 
maybe something in your motherhood and chronic illness journey that has just really resonated with you that you would like to um, share as an inspirational um, uh, thought for our listeners. Yeah, I really like how you were just talking about how you use some of your your non-negotiable me time for your spiritual journey. And I really think that that's just as important for people as, you know, their physical, their mental and their emotional well-being as well. So that's something that I'm going to need to get better at. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know for me doing my non-negotiable, um, uh, daily devotional time, um, is what I call it. Uh, I bought block out usually 30 to 45 minutes and I get up early partially to work. So when my family's sleeping, so I can focus and not be interrupted so much, but also it's also when my internet, to be honest, is the best silly internet issues. I tell you guys, but, um, but yeah, but it also, I will say, even if you're not spiritually, um, a spiritual, like, um, person in terms of practicing a, a certain faith, spiritual connection is still um, very much important. Like even if it's just stopping to pause and breathe and pay attention to what your body's needing, what are you needing right now? Um, or even yes, going out for a walk in nature and just, you know, just kind of releasing and getting out in the open, you know, that's not so um, closed in like our houses can feel, our homes can feel, that's important too. So there's more than one way to be spiritual connected, spiritually connected. And I do talk about that in my workshop. And I do want you guys to also think about if, when you're thinking about your self-care, don't feel like you have to do it exactly like Lauren and I do. And that I, I want you to pay attention to the ebbs and flows of your days. When are you freshest and when do, with your chronic illness, do you feel the best? Is it morning? Is it midday? Is it in the evening? And after, and after the kids go to bed or like for me before, uh, my family wakes up. Um, and what do you like to do? Um, is it um, doing a devotional with some prompt journaling and video lessons? Like what I like to do, I just really gravitate to where I can hear it. And then I can um, uh, journal on it, kind of reflect on it, if you will. And then I kind of have a Bible verse or two to kind of go with it to help me reflect and just remember that truth that I that I feel like I got for that day. There's more than one way to do it. But I want you, the important thing is, if nothing else, I want you to prioritize making time for it every day. It's non-negotiable. <laughs> and to kind of figure out those pockets of days where maybe it might even be different types of self-care. So in the evening, I'm trying to work on um, maybe some reading time, journaling time, um, and also um, uh, just knitting, you know, getting back into my mm -hmm. hobby. Um, date nights with my husband, you know, once a month or twice a month. Um, and just continuing to just be intentional with my hydration and my movement. That's my two simple shifts I'm trying to work on for this week. Um, so there's more than one way to do it. And it's not a concrete forever plan. You can flat, you can be flexible and shift as things change. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. All right. Well, guys, I, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the caregiver coffee chat. Um, feel free to definitely reach out again to Lauren or myself, if you would like to know more about our work and how we could come along and su support you with the resources we have. And Lauren, thank you so much for agreeing to be on and take time out of your day to be on this podcast and um, definitely check out her podcast. Um, you said it was on Spotify and where else is it at Lauren? Apple. Apple. Okay. Apple. And then um, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to the Caregiver Coffee Chat podcast here on Spotify, Apple, Anchor, my YouTube channel, and my website. And stay tuned for another encouraging episode next week of the Caregiver Coffee Chat podcast. Take, take care, Lauren. And thanks again, guys, for listening and watching this week's episode.